side effect and seven of, of them did not. And we want to bound the expected proportion of patients that will have a side effect if we continue giving this same drug to, to new patients. So this is a motivating question, and um, when we ask this question, uh, there are two assumptions that we are making. So the first assumption is that the patients in the sample are sampled independently from the same distribution, and this assumption I will get back to uh, soon. And the second assumption is that the new patients are sampled from the same distribution as the patients that we have validated the treatment on. And this assumption is sort of quite obvious. So if you have data, for example, for, from adults, and then you give the same drug to children, you probably don't expect to have the same number of side effects. Or if you train your language model on, if you train your language model on Shakespeare and then apply it to Twitter, probably you don't also don't expect the same kind of performance when you completely run, transfer the domain. So it's quite an obvious assumption, but it's pretty often ignored, leading to many uh, different problems. Uh, so a little bit of formal background. So we have Z, uh, a random variable. We use the expectation of Z, which is the sum of all possible values, so an integral, if you have a continuous random variable, of the value of that uh, of the value times the probability of uh, observing that value. And throughout the talk, we'll use mu to denote the expectation of this random variable. And for Bernoulli random variable, so if the domain is 0, 1, we have that the expectation of Z is 1 times the probability of observing 1 plus 0 times the probability of observing 0, it's the probability of observing 1. So in case of a Bernoulli random variable, the expectation is equal to the probability of observing 1. Uh, now we will formalize the question that we ask. So we have a sequence of random variables, z1 up to zn where z i's are in this set of 0, 1, and we will also consider more general uh, the interval of 0, 1. So these are the patients that received the drug and either got or didn't get the, the side effect, so 0, o, 1. And we assume that this z1 up to zn are independent, identically distributed, and we use mu hat n to denote the average of these observations. So let's say if we say that a side effect is 1, then 3 out of 10, that's 0 0.3, the empirical mean. And we are interested in inferring the expectation, so what's the expected number of these side effects uh, based on the observed average of side effects. Okay? And, well, you, you may be quite tempted to say, okay, I had 30% of side effects, so that's what I'm going to observe on new samples. But the size of the sample comes into play. So if you take a limit case when n equals 1, so you observe just, you give the drug to just one patient, you observe the effect, the outcome is either 0 or 1. And so if n equals 1, you don't really expect this mu hat to be close to the expectation. Your sample is too small, right? So when you increase the sample, you expect that this mu hat n will get gradually closer to mu. And the question is how fast? So how fast this empirical average approaches the true mean of that random variable? If anyone has any questions, Raise your hand and ask the question. OK. Um, now, I don't know what exactly background. Yes. Yes. So 
so, so in my example, we have 10 patients, we have 10 random variables, n equals 10. For each of them, if a patient got a side effect, then that i equals 1. And if the patient didn't get a side effect, then that i equals 0, no side effect. Okay? And you want to know what's the expected number of side effects that you will have if you continue giving this drug to new patients. Okay? Good. Any other questions? Any other questions? Good. Uh, so again, I'm not sure what sort of uh, background you are coming from, but there are generally two big camps in statistics. There is the frequentist camp and the Bayesian camp. In the Bayesian camp, the, the Bayesian reasoning says that the parameters of the distribution, for example, the, the mean mu, are sampled from some unknown distribution. Or, you know, if we're talking about this Bernoulli random variable, so the probability of, so the probability of z being equal 1 mu is sampled from some unknown distribution. And then Bayesians uh, start with some prior distribution over these parameters, so some distribution that this mu may be equal to some value x. And then they apply the base rule. So they update their belief that mu equals some value given the sample using the base formula. Okay? And in this case, so the probabilities, and we have many probabilities here, the probabilities, they are over observations, Z1 up to Zn, and the parameters, mu. So both the observations and the parameters are considered as random variables, and the probability is over both. Now, if the prior uh, distribution over the parameters doesn't match the reality, then the result falls apart. So, uh, yeah. So th the Bayesians sort of believe in their prior. If the prior matches the true generating distribution for the parameters, everything is fine. If not, then it's not very clear what you're doing. Uh, in the frequentist reasoning, the parameters are unknown but fixed. They are not random variables. So there is some probability of having a side effect, but it's not sampled from the, some distribution or anything. It, it's fixed but unknown. And the frequent is they bound the probability that the observation, this empirical average, deviates strongly from the true value. So what's the probability that it underestimates by more than epsilon, or what's the probability that it overestimates by more than epsilon, or what's the probability that it deviates in either direction by more than epsilon? Okay. And the random variable in this probability expressions, it's the empirical mean or, you know, the zi's, but not mu. And the probability is over the empirical mean, but not over the parameter. So essentially, uh, if we do the frequentist formulation of the problem, we want to bound the probability that the observed empirical mean significantly underestimates, in case that's something we want to upper bound, significantly underestimates the, the true mean. So what's the probability that this empirical average is, uh, sorry, that, that yeah, so that, that underestimates the true mean by more than epsilon. So this is the fragmentist way of asking the question, and this is the, the formulation that we will work with. Any questions about that? Good. Um, so with this up with this formulation in mind, so now I'm going to show a few basic concentration inequalities, a few inequalities that bound this probability that the observed empirical average significantly underestimates the, the true average that we will observe on new samples. And, uh, well, the most basic one is Markov's inequality. And the Markov's inequality tells that 
if you have a non-negative random variable z and any parameter epsilon larger than epsilon, the probability that z exceeds epsilon is bounded by the expectation of z over epsilon. Okay? Maybe just to check where we are generally. Who have seen this thing sometime before in their life? Okay, who has not seen this ever? Okay, good. Um, good, so um, I'll show you a proof of this one. It's quite simple, although it may be still hard to get in, you know, two minutes while you're sitting here, but you can check the slides later. So for the proof, we define a random variable as an indicator that z exceeds this epsilon. So this w equals one if z is larger than epsilon, it's zero otherwise. And in this case, we have that w is smaller than z over epsilon. Okay, so I have an illustration here. So we have this, this is the value of z and this is the value of w. If z is smaller than epsilon, w is zero. So it's smaller than uh, z. If z equals epsilon, then w equals uh, one. So we have this equality, and after that, w is smaller than z. And w is a Bernoulli random variable, so it's either one or zero. And so the probability of w being equal one is equal to the expectation of w. And then we are looking at the probability that z exceeds epsilon. That's the same as the probability that w equals one which is the same as the expectation of w, and now w is bounded by z over epsilon, so this is bounded by the expectation of z over epsilon, and we have gotten the inequality that we wanted to get. Okay? So this is what we have. Uh, how do we use this inequality? And, well, here is the inequality that we have just derived. And we have this z1 up to zn that are Bernoulli ID. Again, you can think about these patients getting treatments and uh, getting the side effects. And we want to bound the probability that um, the empirical mean underestimates the true mean by more than epsilon. That's the way we write it. And first of all, we want to bring this to the form of Markov's inequality. So we want to have random variable on one side and this epsilon on the other side. The random variable is mu hat n. So we can take mu to the other side and we get that the probability that minus mu hat n exceeds epsilon minus mu. Uh, that's the same thing. And now this has the form of Markov's inequality, but we have assumed that z has to be non-negative and the minus empirical mean of Bernoulli random variables, this is negative. So in order to fix it, we add one on both sides of the inequality. So I have one minus the empirical mean here and one minus mu on the other side. Now this random variable is now non-negative, one minus the empirical mean of Bernoulli random variables, that's between zero and one. And this is my new epsilon, so this whole thing is my new epsilon in Markov's inequality. So this is my random variable, this is the epsilon. So this is bounded by the expectation of the random variable over the new epsilon. Uh, the expectation of the empirical mean is the true mean. So we get this, and if you get a bit more calculations, you get that this is bounded by one over epsilon plus one. So this is a bound that you get. And well, you can play with some numbers if you want. Uh, uh, but the point is the, the concentration that's given, th that we get from Markov's inequality, it's not improving with n. It doesn't matter how many samples you have, you get the same bound on the probability. So it's not, it's not improving as we increase the number of samples, even though we would like to have something that shows us that the more we flip this coin, or the more patients they observe, we get closer and closer to the true mean. Uh, we are going to get there. 
Uh, another point to put attention to, so we used an upper bound on Z and the derivation in this step. So we used the fact that Z is upper bounded by one in order to bring this uh, random variable under control. And we did not use independence in this derivation. So this derivation holds even actually even if the random variables are uh, dependent. But again, it's not growing with N. And yeah, we'll also get to this point a bit later. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, I will repeat the question. So the question is, uh, why do we need, why does it has to be a non-negative random variable here? Uh, well, if you check that, so if it would go negative, this inequality is going to break down. And the, the whole proof breaks down, so it doesn't work if it's negative. Hmm? Uh, you can flip, so, so you can prove it so the probability that minus z is smaller than minus epsilon, uh, <laughs> that's how it works. But, but uh, you, yeah, that, that's all you can do with this inequality. Any other questions? More questions? No? Okay. Okay. Uh, moving next step. So we have Chebyshev's inequality. And uh, Chebyshev's inequality tells us that for any positive epsilon, the probability that a random variable deviates from its expectation in the absolute uh, value, so in either direction by more than epsilon, is bounded by the variance of z over epsilon squared. Okay, so this is Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, it's also not very difficult to prove, so I'll show you the proof. Um, so we look at the probability that the absolute value of z minus expectation of z exceeds epsilon. Uh, these both things are positive, so we can take a square, it's the same as the probability that the square of z minus expectation of z exceeds epsilon squared. We just squared both sides of the inequality. And, well, this is Markov's inequality that we used previously, and now we, we take this thing as our random variable and this as our epsilon. And we apply Markov's inequality so that we get that this is bounded by the expectation of the random variable, which is now the difference of z and the expectation of z squared, over the parameter epsilon, which is now epsilon squared. And as you know, the definition of the variance, so this is the variance of the random variable z. Okay? Questions? Good. How do we use this inequality? Uh, so again, we have a sequence of ID random variables. And we will look, now we can look even at the absolute deviation. So we look at the probability that the empirical mean deviates from the true one by more than epsilon. And we have Chebyshev's inequality. So this is bounded by the variance of um, of the random variable, the variance of the empirical mean over epsilon squared, and I'm expanding what is this ex empirical mean. Well, that's the average of the random variables. Okay. Uh, so this is direct application of Chebyshev's inequality. And now I remind you, so if we have independent random variables, then the variance of a sum is uh, a sum of the variances, and if we have any constant, then the variance of a constant times the random variable is the constant square, square times that same random variable. So we have this constant of 1 over n. If we take it outside of the variance, it will be 1 over n squared. And we have the sum of the random variable, so the variance of the sum will be the sum of the variances, and they are id, so it's n times the variance of any of them. 
So, and we had n squared from the one over n, so we get that this is equal to variance of any of them, let's say the first one over n times epsilon squared. So the probability that the empirical mean of this uh, n id variables deviates by more than epsilon from the true mean is bounded by the variance over of any single uh, random variable over n epsilon squared. So we got a concentration that now improves with n. The more times we flip the coin or the more patients we observe, we are getting the average with high probability gets closer and closer to the true mean of that coin. Uh, and now we have used independence. So in, in this step, we have used independence of the random variables in order to take the variance inside the summation. Any questions about this? Yes. 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 So mu is fixed, and mu bar n. This is the random variable. And the question is again: we, we observe this empirical mean. We have observed that three out of ten, uh, three out of ten uh, patients got a side effect. And the question is: what's the probability that this observation deviates significantly from the true mean? from the true expectation of having a side effect. But in Chibetchev uh, inequality, z is, uh, mu is equivalent to z when we want to apply it. And mu is not a uh, random variable, no? Mm -hmm. So in Chebyshev's inequality, so z is the same as mu hat n. It's in the absolute value, so we can swap them. That's the same. So the expect so mu is the expectation of mu hat n. In expectation, the average is the true mean, but it has some deviations. Okay. If you look at expectation of mu hat n, it's mu. So mu is the expectation of z, and mu hat n, it's the z hmm, okay, in okay. Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, thank you. Okay? Yes? Uh, so they are independent, identically distributed, so they have the same distribution, which means that the variance of any of them is the same. So you can put that n here, if, uh, so you can put any index here, okay? Uh, good? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, moving forward, uh, we have Hovding's inequality. So we are trying to get tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, so now we have Hovding's inequality. So if we have ID random variables in the 0, 1 interval with expectation mu, then for any epsilon greater than epsilon, the probability that the empirical mean overestimates the true mean by, by more than epsilon is bounded by the exponent of minus twice n epsilon squared, and the probability that it underestimates the true mean is also bounded by the same quantity. Uh, and these two are known as one-sided Hovding's inequality, so they don't hold simultaneously. If you want to have a simultaneous thing, so you have the corollary, which is two-sided Hovding's inequality, so the probability that it mu deviates from mu hat in either side by epsilon is bounded by the probability that it deviates to the left or deviates to the right, and it's bounded by twice the, uh, the exponents. And this is a union bound, so the probability that event A or event B happens is bounded by the sum of the probabilities of the two events. Okay, so let's make another check. Who has seen Hovding's inequality before? Well, okay, who has not seen that? Okay, so we are moving a little bit forward. Um, anyone has any immediate questions? Yes. Uh, 
Um, the so what? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, you can generalize it to any bounded random variable. So you need boundedness, and then the scale, so the the range of the random va variable will show up in the inequality. I am doing it for zero one to to make it a little bit simpler, but. Yeah, you can have the range in there. Um, any any other questions? So anything that we do for random variables bounded in the zero one interval can obviously be extended to any bounded random variable by just rescaling it to the zero one interval, doing the bound and then rescaling back. Uh, and well, what we got that by Hovdik's inequality, the empirical mean convergence converges to the true mean exponentially fast in n. Okay? So the probability that it deviates by more than epsilon decreases exponentially fast as the number of samples n grows. So that's quite a powerful thing. Uh, but sort of before, so I, I, I'm also going to show a proof, but before I go for the proof, let's understand the bound a little bit. So what does it tell us and how we work with it? So this is the bound, so the probability that the true mean underestimates the, sorry, the, the empirical mean underestimates the true mean by more than epsilon is bounded by this exponent. And we denote the right-hand side by delta. So this is the probability that uh, this is a bound on the probability that the empirical mean runs too far to the left of the true mean. Uh, if I solve this, uh, so exponent of minus twice n epsilon squared equals delta, then I get that epsilon is equal to the square root of logarithm of 1 over delta over n. So it's just take this equality and you get this epsilon. If you want two-sided, then you will have 2 over delta instead of 1 over delta. Um, so rewriting, so substituting this epsilon into the equation, we get the, the probability that the empirical mean underestimates the true mean by more than square root of log of 1 over delta over 2n is bounded by delta. Uh, so this is another way of uh, looking at this inequality. And um, so the probability that it underestimates uh, by more than the square root of log of 1 over n log of 1 over delta over 2n uh, is smaller than delta. So if I take the negation of this inequality, then the probability that the mu hat of n is close to the true mean by, doesn't exceed this true mean by more than the square root, is at least 1 minus delta. So with probability at least 1 minus delta, mu hat n is within the square root of the true mean. and this square root is known as precision. So uh, how precisely mu hat n estimates mu. And this 1 minus delta is known as confidence. So how confident we are that the true mean is within the square root of, sorry, the empirical mean is within the square root of the, of the true mean. And again, you can also put a, an absolute value here by replacing 1 over delta by 2 over delta. So here is an illustration. We have the true mean. We have the number of samples n. And as the number of samples grows, the, the empirical mean with high probability stays within this uh, range from the, from the true mean where the range decreases at the rate of square root of log of 1 over delta over 2n. Any questions? OK. And there is a trade-off, so we can take, um, we can take a smaller delta and then the interval gets larger. So if you want, if you want high confidence, if you want uh, high uh, one minus delta, you have to compromise on precision and the other way around. So 
uh, if you want high precision, then you have to compromise on confidence. There is interplay between these two things that depends on how many samples you have. And if you take two extreme cases, so if you take delta equals zero, so you want confidence of one, then you can't control the, uh, the empirical mean. So all you can say that the empirical mean is within infinity from the true mean. And if you take, if you want zero confidence, uh, so if you don't require any confidence, then you can say that the empirical mean is at least the true mean. Um, this also is jump going a little bit aside from the online reference learning, but this inequality gives rise to this so known as pro probably approximately correct learning framework, the, which is the um, theoretical learning framework more in the offline learning. So, and why is it the pro probably approximately correct? So with high probability, with probability one minus delta, the empirical mean is approximately equal to the to the true mean. So this is the probably approximately correct learning framework. And again, to remind you, the, the probability here is over mu hat n, which is the random variable, and not over mu, which is a deterministic quantity. So even though these inequalities are often written in a form of bounding mu in terms of mu hat n, the random variable is mu hat n, and it's the probability that the empirical observation deviates from the true value. Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to get a similar results like this, but for uh, um, some probability. And uh, like we want to estimate a density, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to get an epsilon delta pack estimate like you did here. Um, or uh, if I want to rephrase it, um, mm -hmm. so let's say I want to estimate a functional. Mm -hmm. So we have um, uh, a model, and we want to estimate a functional of this model. So. Mm -hmm. um, do we use the same, uh, um, like, similar? Uh, so if you want to estimate the, the density, which means that you want to estimate the whole distribution, estimating the whole distribution that's, that Actually, gives you more information than estimating just the mean. OK. OK, so it requires a bit different tools to achieve this. Uh, what we show here are tools for estimating the mean of of a distribution based on observations, not not the whole distribution. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Uh, and well, there are different ways of using this bound. So again, to remind you, we have this delta, which is confidence, and it's equal to e minus two, two n epsilon squared. This is what we just did here. Uh, if we solve this equation, we have the precision expressed in terms of confidence and the, size, the number of samples, and we have n, which we can also express in this equation based on delta and based on epsilon. So we can fix any two parameters out of the three. The three parameters are epsilon, delta, and n, precision, conf confidence, and sample size, and the inequality gives us the value of the third parameter. So how can we see it? So let's say that we fix n and epsilon, and then we get delta. What's the question that we are answering? So what is the probability that mu hat n underestimates mu by more than epsilon, given that we have n samples? So n and epsilon are fixed, and then the inequality gives us a bound on the probability. We can also fix n and delta, and then ask about epsilon. So what is the maximal underestimation of mu by mu hat n that can be guaranteed with probability at least 1 minus delta given a sample of size n? So again, you have a fixed sample. 
and then someone tells you, give me a guarantee that will hold with 95%, that the sample is not deviating too strongly, so how good guarantee you can get? You substitute your confidence, you substitute N, and you get the precision that you can achieve with a given sample size at the desired confidence. And then finally, if we fix epsilon and delta, then you have this question, how many samples do we need in order to guarantee that mu hat n doesn't underestimate mu by more than epsilon with probability at least one minus delta. So you fix the precision, you say, I want to be within 0 0.01 from the true mean with probability 99%. How many patients do you have to collect in order to achieve this target precision with the target confidence. Okay? So these are the three ways to use the bound. You can fix any two parameters, precision, confidence, or the size of the sample, and then get uh, the answer for the third parameter that you had, uh, have not fixed. Questions? Doing with time, yes. No questions. Um, okay, uh, let's um, let's show a proof of this inequality, and then I will give you a short break, and then we will continue. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so this is the inequality. Um, and in order to prove the inequality, we have Hovding's lemma, which I will not go, uh, I will not prove. But the Hovding lemma says that if we have a random variable in the zero-one interval and the parameter lambda that's positive, the ex expectation of the exponent is bounded by the exponent of lambda square over eight. Now the proof is the proof is a bit longer. It's not that I expect that within whatever two minutes you can follow the proof, but I just want to show you a, a couple of key points in the proof. Uh, yeah. So, uh, a proof of Hovding's inequality. So, uh, so this is the inequality. Uh, well, I've taken the deviation on the other side. Uh, this is the inequality that we want to prove. We can multiply both sides by n. This gives us uh, this expression, and now the first thing that we do, we apply Chernoff's bounding technique. So for any parameter lambda that's larger than epsilon, we have that x is larger than y only if exponent of lambda x is larger than exponent of lambda y. So I'm taking both sides of the expression to the, to the exponent and with the parameter lambda. And again, this holds if and only if this holds, so this doesn't change the probability. Now I can apply Markov's inequality, and this thing is my random variable, so I'm looking at the expectation of the left-hand side, and this is my epsilon, so this is the exponent of lambda and epsilon in the denominator. Uh, I just take it as negative expon uh, exponent here. And here I have an exponent of a summation. An exponent of a summation is a product of exponents. So I have expectation of the product of exponent of lambda times uh, this thing. So I've separated the summation over the random variables into a product of the random variables. And now comes... Uh, you know, the critical step where we use independence. So if we have independent random variables, expectation of x, y equals expectation of x, expectation of y. It holds for independent random variables. It does not necessarily hold for random variables that are dependent. Uh, so if I apply this, I can take the product outside of the expectation. So I get the product of the expectation of this thing. And now I can apply Hovding's lemma that I had here, one by one, to each of the elements here. And, well, get an exponent depending on lambda. And then I can find 
lambda that would minimize, so this lambda star equals four epsilon, I can find this lambda, and if I substitute this lambda all the way through, then I get the bound that I wanted to get, okay? And again, you can sit at home and go through this one more time, but a critical point here is we have used independence in order to prove this inequality, okay? Um, any questions? Yeah, there is a question here. Okay, good. Uh, would we get a tighter bound on the absolute value if you used uh, Chebyshev's inequality? If we look at the probability of the absolute value deviating? Uh, I mean, because we had to use uh, like a very loose bound to, uh, to uh, bound the probability of z minus mu in absolute value lower than epsilon, but here can we uh, directly use uh, Chebyshev's inequality? Is there something similar? Um, you can apply Chebyshev, then you will get Chebyshev, but uh, yeah, at least I don't see immediately why it okay, could help. You. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you you have the you have this property. You have yeah. to be able to. Um, yeah, I understand. Uh, that. I'm wondering if, if you are asking if they are non-correlated. Yeah, if they are non-correlated, you will get the same the same thing. Yes. If this holds and it holds for independent, but it doesn't hold in general. Uh, if this holds, then you get you, you can have the inequality through. No, if I'm uh, saying if this does not hold, but yeah. uh, there's a bound on the pairwise covariance. Uh, no. So there's like no. a no. epsilon by which this is violated. Uh, but the epsilon is a given bound. You you would have to go through the derivation to see what you get there. Okay. So so there's okay. no known result. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, maybe a bit more general question. Um, uh -huh. When you try to rule a bound, what is usually the thought process that you arrive at a result? I mean, what what would be the the exploration of your your thought to try to rule the power. So, 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 I mean, just a general question. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the best bound or what? No, I no, what this would be a thought process. Thought process, how, yeah. how you get it? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a difficult question. Question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, 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 after you do many of them, you get some intuition of how you can get new ones, but uh, I'm not sure I can formalize. Uh, and uh, I mean, you you can derive things just for the fun of it, but there are um, there are certain deviations that you need to bound for different applications, and then if you need to bound a certain deviation, then you start staring at it and trying to bound it in one way or another. Okay, okay. then it's based on experience then. <laughs> uh, based on experience, based on the needs. So depending what you need to control, then you're trying to, to control that thing and either you succeed in controlling it or you can sometimes prove that you cannot control certain things. Mm. Okay. That also happens, okay? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? There is one more question down here. So, oh, thank you. So if we have a Hofdin-like inequality for um, a random variable, mm -hmm. uh, can we uh, deduce um, 
uh, uh, of the inequality for a property of those random variables. So it could be, for example, the entropy or either a univariate property or bivariate property like KL divergence or something like that. So again, this thing, it only gives you the bounds on how the empirical average deviates from the true average. If you want more things, there are different tools for uh, other things, and but you you have to, to to study the you know the problem that you have and the quantity that you have to control and see how you can control the quantity that you are interested in. Okay. Again, this thing it's only controlling the deviation of the empirical mean from the true mean. If you want other parameters, well, then you need to look at this other parameter and and see how they uh, deviate and so on. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then, uh, yeah, the important point here is that this lambda star is independent of the random variables. Um, and, well, before letting you on a break, I'll give you a question. Uh, that you can try to solve. Uh, so we have talked about the importance of independence. Uh, you know, I mean, we have used it in Hovding's inequality, we have used it in Chebyshev's inequality, but, uh, you know, we have tried different inequalities, we're getting better and better, and maybe we could have some other inequality that doesn't require independence and still uh, provides concentration, okay? So here is a question. So uh, construct an example of dependent random variables, z1 up to zn, such that these random variables take value 0 or 1. Uh, they have the same expectation, so they all have expectation mu. I didn't put it on the slide, but so they all have expectation mu, but they are dependent, OK? And you want to construct this set of dependent random variables such that the probability that the empirical mean of the random variables always, so with probability one, deviates from the true mean by at least one half. Is the question clear? So if we look at Hovding's inequality, Hovding's inequality tells us that the probability that the empirical mean deviates from the true mean by more than epsilon decreases with the number of samples if we have independence. Now you are asked to construct an example where the distance between the empirical mean and the true mean is not decreasing with n. It's always one half, no matter how many random variables you take with probability one. Is the question clear to everyone? Or anyone has questions on? You have no idea what I'm asking for, or you know what I'm asking for and Huh? You need to construct a distribution over z1 up to zn where they are dependent, okay? So you need to construct dependent random variables. Yes. Uh, I'm not yet asking for an answer, yes. Yeah, I'm not really in with this background, but is that some kind of distribution when some, some event happens in the one uh, variable, all the other ones become zero or something like that? Like, what uh, could that be Poisson's or? You are on the right track, but your construction will not, I mean, if, they are all, if all others are zero, they will not have mean mu. No, at some they, point. Like, they, they, uh, they all have to have the same mean. 
uh, and they may be dependent, okay? Uh, so I suggest I give you all a break of um, eight minutes until half past ten. You can think about this or you can just relax. So half past ten, we, we continue, okay? So in the interest of time, I'll just tell you an answer to this problem. Uh, so let's say that I take a bunch of coins I tie them all together, and then I flip them together, okay? So I have n random variables. They all have the same distribution. They all have the same mean, but they are dependent. They all have the same value, okay? So I have n coins. I have tied them together, and then I flip them all together. So the empirical mean will be either 0 or 1, no matter how many coins I have in this stack. Okay. Assuming that the true mean is 1 half, then here I have either 0 or 1. The true mean is 1 half, so the distance is one half to the mean, no matter how many coins I take. Okay? And what's the problem? The problem is that the coins that I add are not adding me any more information. They are all dependent, they don't add any information, so it doesn't matter how many I take, I'm staying the same distance from, from the mean. When they are independent, then every flip of a coin gives me a little bit of information about the mean, and if I average over many coins, eventually I'm getting close to the mean. But when they are dependent, they're not providing new information, and the average is not going to the mean. So this independence is very crucial in order to get estimation of the mean that will converge eventually with the growing number of samples. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Uh, it sounds like there is some microphone somewhere working, no? Okay, maybe not. Okay, so um, now another important point. So, so far we have talked about sort of flipping multiple times a single coin and how the empirical mean of that coin converges to the, to the true value. If we start doing selection, then we need to take a union bound, okay? And I will illustrate this. Uh, so for a first thing, I'm taking a little bit maybe weird example, but so I have a bag of coins and they all have the same bias mu. So the expectation of that coin is mu. I am taking one coin out of that bag, I flip it n times, I get the empirical mean. I take another coin, flip it n times, get the second empirical mean, and so on, so I try it k times. I get, get k different empirical means. So for any fixed i, for any coin, the probability that the empirical mean deviates from the true mean by Hofding's inequality is bounded by delta, so we have that the empirical mean doesn't deviate by more than the square root from the true mean, okay? Now let's say that I want to select the best coin, so I select i star, which is the arg mean over i of the empirical means. I, out of these outcomes, I select an outcome that gave me the best outcome, the smallest mean. Now, if I look at the expectation of this, the empirical mean of i star, it will not be equal to mu, okay? So, each mean individually is an unbiased estimate and it concentrates, but the empirical mean of the best coin 
uh, that's not the, the true mean of the coin. If you, you know, if you do it too many times, you will, with high probability, have a coin that will always have zero, for example, which is not the mean. And since this is, um, the mu is not the mean of this mu hat i, uh, sorry, it should have been n i star, um, we cannot apply Hovding's inequality because Hovding's inequality assumes that this mean is the mean of this random variable. Uh, so if we want to bound the probability that the uh, empirical mean of the best coin deviates from the true mean by more than something, we have to correct the inequality and we have to take this k, which will now come in a few steps, it will come from a union bound. So instead of this log of one over delta, I have to put log of k over delta. Now the probability that the empirical mean of the best coin deviates from the true mean by more than the square root is bounded by the probability that there exists any i, any coin for which the empirical mean deviates from the true mean by more than this square root. Okay, the probability that it happens for the best one is bounded by the probability that it happens for any of them. And now I'm taking a union bound, so the probability that there exists such a coin for which the empirical mean deviates from the true mean by more than the square root is bounded by the sum over the coins of the probability that it deviates for any uh, particular coin by more than this square root. And now to this quantity, I can apply Hovding's inequality because uh, I have separated the dependence between coins and the mean. So now I have again these coins individually and for any fixed one, I have the inequality, but I have the inequality with k over delta instead of one over delta. So by Hovding, I get that this probability is bounded by delta over k because I have replaced one over delta by k over delta. So I have delta over k and if I sum it, I get delta. So I get that the probability that the mean of the best coin deviates from the true one uh, by more than square root of something that we have k here, which again comes from the union bound, is bounded by delta. So now I am in control of deviations of the best coin from the true mean. Questions? If I am not taking too many coins, so this log of k over delta is not going to be too large and I will be able to control this deviation. If I'm flipping it too many times, if log k becomes of the same order as n, then, yeah, then I will lose the control of concentration which is also intuitively, again, if you repeat this experiment again and again and again and again, at some point you will, with quite high probability, say, get all zeros. Okay. Uh, okay, now a little bit more interesting example, but the same flavor. So now I have a bag of coins, let's say drugs or treatments, with different biases. Uh, there are some people talking and it's a little bit disturbing. Um, uh, so I have a bag of coins with different biases and now I want to select the best treatment out of this bag of treatments. I don't know the quality of each treatment or the quality of each drug. I take each of these drugs, I try them n times, I get this empirical means and now I want to select which is the um, which is the best drug, okay? So, and again, for any fixed drug, the probability that the empirical mean deviates from the true mean by more than the square root is bounded by delta, okay? Um, but now, if I take the best drug, I take the, the one that minimizes the empirical mean, which is, well, a natural thing to do, uh, then again, the expectation, and I forgot n again here, but the expectation of the best one is not equal to the expectation of that one because we have done selection based on the outcomes. It's the same logic as we had just on the slide before when they were all identical, and we can't apply Hovding again. 
but we can do the same trick as we did before. So we can look at the probability that the uh, mean of the treatment that was selected deviates from the, the empirical mean of the treatment that was selected deviates from the true mean by more than um, the square root. And again, we have k here is bounded by the probability that for any treatment there is this deviation. And then we take the union bound and we take Hovding's inequality and this is bounded by delta. And again, this k that we have to put here instead of one, this is the price of doing the selection. And the bound is meaningful if the amount of selection, the number of different drugs that we're trying is significantly smaller than the exponent of the number of samples that we have. If we are selecting, if the number of drugs we are selecting from ex is exponential in the number of samples, then we are getting something that's larger than one here, and that's not very interesting because, yeah, well, we know that it's bounded in the zero one. Yes. Uh, so k is the number of coins that I select. Yeah, that's the, 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 number of the number of experiments that you have done, yeah. The number of coins or the number of drugs, yes. And that's, that's the union bound that you have to take. You have to take the union bound over all the selections that you have done. Okay. Any other questions? Um, good. Uh, so a mid summary of what we have done so far. So we have shown this Hovding's inequality that for ID random variables in the zero one interval, the probability that the empirical mean underestimates the true mean by more than the square root is bounded by delta. And independence is crucial here. So if there is no independence, things don't work. And if we do selection, if we select from multiple experiments, then we have to take a union bound over this uh, experiments that we did, okay? Um, good. Uh, I have many slides. I guess I'm not going to do all of them, but yeah, we will see. Uh, so now, uh, well, we have started with Markov's inequality, then Chebyshev, then Hovding. It was getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Can we get something that will be even tighter than Hovding's inequality? Well, here is one example, the KL inequality. Uh, in order to define the KL inequality, I have to define the Kulbeck library of divergence or relative entropy, which is a distance measure between probability distributions P and Q. And it's defined in this way. So it's the expectation with respect to Z drawn according to P of the logarithm of P of Z over Q of Z. And uh, it has certain properties, so it's the distance between P and P is zero, it's convex and it's asymmetric. And we define the binary KL function, which is if P and Q are biases of Bernoulli random variables, then, well, this is the definition of KL. Uh, now we're not going to do anything explicitly with the KL, so um, I'm going to simplify it later, so if if you see it for the first time, well, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so we're moving uh, to the next slide where I will show simplifications of this KL that will be a bit easier to digest. digest. Uh, and we have the KL inequality. So the KL inequality tells us that if we have ID random variables in the zero one interval with mean mu, then for any parameter delta in zero one, the probability that the KL between the empirical mean and the true mean exceeds log of one over delta over N is bounded by delta. Yes. Mu is the expectation of the random variables. Yeah, 
interpreted the, as the constant random in, variable in this case. You mean in the binary KL? KL? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the binary KL, again, um, in the binary KL, P and Q are just numbers, biases of Bernoulli random variable. And this is the definition of uh, the binary KL, where P and Q are numbers in 0, 1. OK? Um, yeah. And again, I mean, if you see it for the first time, it's, uh, don't worry, I'm going to simplify this on the next slide. So I, I will make it more digestible on the next slide. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is the KL inequality, and again, uh, don't worry if you see this KL for the first time, it's not the most important part uh, here, uh, because we're going to relax it. So we have, we have the KL inequality that the probability that this KL is smaller than log of 1 over delta is larger than 1 minus delta. And we have Pinsker's inequality, which says that the KL is uh, lower bounded by twice the difference between mu and mu hat squared, which means that I can, so I can take a square root of this, I can put it on the left side of the inequality, and I get that as a corollary of this KL inequality, I get that the probability that the distance between the true mean and the empirical mean exceeds the square root is at least 1 minus delta. Okay, and if you recall Hovding's inequality, well, it's essentially the same thing up to this one or two. Uh, so the KL inequality is always at least as tight as Hovding's inequality. Okay, well, that's good, but uh, yeah, sort of. <laughs> Why introducing complicated quantities if we get the same thing as before? Uh, so there is refined Pinsker's inequality that says that uh, for mu that's uh, larger than mu hat, we have another relaxation. And if we do re this relaxation and we do a little bit of calculations, then we get that from this inequality, we, we can also get this inequality, okay? And this is something, uh, so this also follows from the KL inequality, and this is something well, relatively easy to digest and uh, more interesting. So what we get here is that, um, so if we look at, say, this inequality, the distance between mu and mu hat decreases at the rate of log of 1 over delta over uh, 2n. Here, if mu hat n is close to 0, or if it's zero, uh, we get that the, the distance here decreases at the rate of one over n instead of one over square root n. Okay, uh, so we get what's called fast convergence rates, the rates of one over n rather than one over square root n. And this may be significantly tighter than Hovding if the empirical mean is much smaller than one over eight. Okay, so this is another inequality, and instead of, you know, just for any random variable in the zero, one, we get the same rate of convergence. Here it tells us that if the empirical mean happens to be close to zero, we are even more confident that it's close to the true mean. Okay, so when the empirical mean is close to zero, we have even better bounds on being close to the to the true mean. So if you have a coin and you flip it 100 times and you get always zero, you are more sure that this empirical mean of zero is close to the true mean than if you take a coin and you flip it 100 times and you get an average of, of one half. So when you have the average of one half, there is quite high deviation to the left and to the right. Sometimes you get zero, sometimes you get one. If everything is constantly zero, you have a higher confidence that the true mean is also zero. Okay? This is the message of this inequality. Um, questions? 
Yes. There, up there. Uh, this fact feels a bit surprising to me. I would have thought if you move a random variable by like a constant factor in either direction, then none of the uh, concentration inequalities change. But this seems to be the case here, right? Uh, it's not a matter of shifting. It's a matter of the, the variance of this random variable. So if you have a random variable in the 0, 1 interval with mean, so if you have a Bernoulli random variable with mean 1 half, it has a high variance. If you have Bernoulli random variable with mean 0, which means it's always 0, then it has a small variance. And uh, random variables with small variance, they have stronger concentration than random variables with high variance. OK, that makes sense. OK. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. I guess you follow then that the same is true if you flip a coin and it keeps coming close, close to one. Yes, the same, but yeah, you also have pin scarce inequality in the other direction. So if it's close to zero or if it's close to one, and we're talking about the zero one interval, we get uh, better conversion. You don't see it from this inequality, but you have it like from the KL with a different derivation, you can also get it. If it's close to one, you also get faster convergence. Um, any other questions? Good. Um, yeah, and well, this was a relaxation of the KL inequality, and the KL inequality itself is even tighter than what you see in this relaxation, but the idea is the same. And well, this is just a slide again. You can, in principle, directly invert the KL inequality because it's convex and you can do binary search and whatever. So uh, if you invert it directly, you get something that's even tighter than what we have seen on the previous slide. But yeah, I will skip this one. Uh, can we be even, even tighter than that? Well, the next step is Bernstein's inequality. Um, so Bernstein's inequality tells us that, again, we have ID random variables that are bounded by C, and we have the second moment or the variance, depending on what formulation you are using. And uh, it tells us that the probability that the true mean exceeds, sorry, the empirical mean underestimates the true mean by more than the square root of twice the variance of the individual random variables over N. and some extra factor is bounded by delta. So previously we were looking at the mean and we were saying if the mean is close to zero, we have tighter concentration. Uh, here um, we have that if the variance is close to zero, we are getting better concentration. Uh, but there is a bit of a challenge that the, the variance may be unknown. So we don't know the distribution, we don't know the variance, but this problem is in principle solvable. So there is empirical Bernstein inequality, which the idea is to bound the variance in terms of the empirical variance and then plug it back into Bernstein's inequality. And then you get this inequality, which is, uh, well, if you look at this inequality and you compare it with Bernstein's inequality, it's essentially the same thing. The, the true variance is replaced by the empirical variance and you have a little bit worse constants on this additive term, but but not by much. So you have seven over three instead of one. And you have this log of two over delta because you are taking a union bound, so you have a bound on the variance, and then you have a bound on the random variable, so you have to take a union bound, and then you get log of two over delta instead of log of one over delta. Okay, is there a question? No? Um, and there is also an alternative approach known as unexpected Bernstein's inequality, and there you can do a direct devi deviation, uh, derivation based on empirical second moment instead of bounding the variance and then bounding the random variable itself, and then you get some complicated result that I will not go into. But the point is that the direct de derivation often gives you a bit tighter bound than doing this two-step, first bounding the variance and then bounding the, um, the deviation. Uh, so how does this 
empirical or unexpected Bernstein compares to Hovding's inequality. So this is, and I will take random variables in the mi minus one half half. So I will shift it a bit just to make the comparison easier. So this is Hovding's inequality and this is Bernstein's inequality. And um, if we have this random variable, the variance is bounded by one quarter. So in the worst case, from, uh, from Bernstein's inequality, we get this inequality, which is a little bit weaker than Hovding. So in the worst case, um, yeah, so if the variance is really small, then we get this one over n, we get fast convergence, and the Empirical unexpected Bernstein are significantly tighter than Hovding. And if the variance is approximately one quarter, then it's a little bit worse than Hovding because we have this additive term. But in general, it's not much worse than Hovding and sometimes maybe much better if the variance is small. So it, it, it can exploit the small variance. Uh, how this Bernstein compares with the KL and, well, we take the relaxation of KL, which exploits uh, the small mean, and we have the Bernstein, and taking just normal Bernstein uh, based on the variance. Um, the variance, if we are talking about random variables in the 0-1 interval, is bounded by the mean, so the variance is smaller than the mean. So in general, um, so we can get a similar looking bound from Bernstein's inequality. So in, in principle, Bernstein's inequality is typically not much worse than the KN inequality because the variance that's used here is smaller than the empirical mean or the mean. Uh, but for Bernoulli random variables, the additive terms are better in the KL. So if you have uh, KL, the variance is actually the same as the mean, and the KL inequality is always tighter, but if there is a large probability mass inside the zero one interval, so if the variance is small but the mean is not small, uh, then Bernstein's inequality is better and maybe significantly better. If the mean is large but the variance is small. Um, yeah, and if you have, if you want to get best of both, then there is, for example, a split KL inequality where you can split the random variable and apply KL to each of that. But yeah, this I will also skip. Okay, so a quick summary of these inequalities. Um, so we have Hovding's inequality, which is a zeroth order inequality. It doesn't. Uh, exploit any properties of the distribution. It's the same, it's only based on the range of the random variable, and that has the slow rates. We have the KL, which is the first order inequality, and it has fast rates if the empirical mean is small, uh, and it's the best inequality if you have Bernoulli random variables. If you have Bernoulli, then work with KL inequality. And we have the empirical unexpected Bernstein inequality, which is a second order uh, consideration inequality, and it gives fast rates if the empirical variance is small. Okay? Um, yeah. So, I guess I'm getting <laughs> close to, to the end of my time. Uh, I'll give you very, very quickly what other things are possible to do without, again, mentioning too much details. So, so far we have talked about concentration inequalities for bounded random variables. Random variables bounded in some interval, it can be any interval, we can rescale it to the zero one interval that we have mainly discussed. If we have unbounded random variables, you have to assume some form of still uh, control on this distribution. So one uh, possibility is Hovding's inequality for sub-Gaussian random variables. So if you assume that the tails of the distribution of the random variable decay at least as fast as Gaussian distribution, and this is one way to define this sub-Gaussian distribution, and you can see that this is very similar to Hovding's lemma that was used in Hovding's inequality, and you can go back and through the proof 
and you can get an inequality which is essentially the same as Hovding's inequality with the variance factor. So if you have unbounded random variable, but its tails decay faster than Gaussian, then you can also have something similar to Hovding's inequality. And the last thing, so we have mentioned the importance of independence. Uh, and we have talked independence, independence, independence. If you don't have independence, then everything breaks down. There is one exception where you may have a certain form of dependence and it still works, and it's martingales. Uh, so there is the holding kazum inequality of martingales. So if you have a sequence of random variables where the conditional uh, expectation of a random variable stays the same, then you have the same inequality as Hovding's inequality. And most others of the KL inequality, the Bernstein's inequality, you can generalize to Martingales. So if you have this sequential dependence, the distribution is not the same for every consecutive random variable. Uh, they may depend on each other, but the mean stays the same. Uh, then you can have, again, the same inequalities. So a summary of what I showed you today. So we have shown a bunch of inequalities, Hovdings, which is the zeroth order, depends on only on the range. We have KL, which is the first order, exploits small mean and tied for Bernoulli random variables. We have empirical and unexpected Bernstein's inequality, which is the second order, and it's good if you have small variance. Uh, we touched upon, so if you have unbounded random variables, you have to assume some form of uh, niceness of this distribution, for example, sub-Gaussian tails, and then you can also have uh, Hovding-like inequalities. We have talked about importance of independence, so if you have dependent random variables, things break down, except if you have Martin Gale, so if you have the sequential dependence when the mean stays the same, then you can generalize everything that was mentioned here to Martin Gales. And finally, if you are doing selection, remember to take union bounds. So if you are selecting out of different experiments, remember to take union bounds. And if you, if you want to read more, I have another slide with a bunch of references, and well, I guess my material will be uploaded, so you will see the references and you can read more there. Thank you.